Good evening. Gumba Malgang, Gumba Nani Gienadu, Yurigiri State Library of Queensland Gu, which is good evening, it's good to see you, and welcome friends to the State Library of Queensland in Burragum, which is the traditional language of the community that I grew up on the Darling Downs. I'm Vicky McDonald, and it's my great privilege to be the State Librarian and CEO here at the State Library of Queensland, your State Library. And I'd also like to welcome you to this much anticipated Game Changers event with Stephen Page AO. I also would like to begin by acknowledging Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and their continuing connection to land and as custodians of stories for millennia. At State Library, we are inspired by this tradition in our work to share and preserve Queensland's memory for future generations. I extend a very warm welcome to our speaker, the absolutely game-changing choreographer and artistic director of Bangara Dance Theatre, Stephen Page AO. So Stephen did admit to me earlier this is his first visit to State Library of Queensland, but I'm sure <laughs> it will not be his last. So welcome, Stephen. Fantastic to have you here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I also welcome our facilitator, arts producer and educator, Janelle Christophers, members of the Library Board of Queensland, the Queensland Library Foundation Council and the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame Management Committee and Induction Committee. We also welcome our founding partner, the QUT Business School, and generous sponsors, Picture Partners, Channel 7, Morgans, and Ray White. And friends and supporters of the State Library joining us here in the auditorium, as well as online tonight. Game Changers is a Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame initiative, a partnership between QUT Business School, the State Library of Queensland, and the Queensland Library Foundation. The Foundation supports the Game Changer series and many other important projects. If you value what this brings to the community, please consider making a tax-deductible donation to the Queensland Library Foundation to inspire more possibilities through knowledge, stories and creativity. As you probably guessed, we're absolutely thrilled to have Stephen Page with us this evening. Not just because he is a superstar on the global stage, but because, like State Library, storytelling is at the heart of what he does. Stephen and his colleagues at Bangara Dance Theatre are fire makers and storytellers, and they have been part of the theatre landscape for over 30 years. Bangara means to make fire in the Wurundjeri language, and the company is one of the only all First Nations dance companies in the world. It is at the forefront of arts and culture in Australia and internationally. Closer to home, Stephen is a new knuckle Manaljali man of the Yugamba nation. One of 12 children in the very talented Page family, Stephen grew up in Mount Gravatt East and attended Cavendish Road High School. Really? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> St Stephen is a much admired creative business leader, epitomising resilience, guardianship, collaboration and bold vision. A local boy made very good. Janelle Christophus will be expertly, expertly facilitating this evening's conversation. Thank you, Janelle. And Janelle is an arts producer, educator and advocator. She and Stephen are dear friends and have worked closely together at QPAC. For over 20 years, Janelle co-presented Bangara's annual season of works. Tonight's conversation is broadcast on Facebook Live and on State Library of Queensland's live stream page. So tonight we'll be using Slido to collect questions from both online and auditorium audiences. So if you go to slido.com and enter the event code QBLHOF, or simply the scan the QR code that appears on the screen um, throughout the event, and we'll bring the, uh, the QR code up throughout the evening. Uh, slido.com is very democratic. You can vote for people's questions, and the, the uh, questions with the most votes go to the top. So do check slido.com out. Janelle will do her best to get to as many questions as possible. If you experience connection issues on our website, head over to the Facebook page to view the talk there. And if you are sharing your thoughts about tonight's conversation on social media, please use the hashtag QBLHoff. Finally, I'd like to invite you to Queensland to a tea exhibition, which is here on level two in the SLQ gallery after Game Changers. So when you're leaving uh, tonight's conversation, if you just go straight ahead, you'll be going into the SLQ gallery to see our latest exhibition, Queensland to a tea, 
which gives you a unique perspective on Queensland's social history. We've arranged that the exhibition will be open tonight um, and you, so you will have that special viewing. And it certainly shows Queensland's unique history in fun and fascinating ways. If you love our thought-provoking talks here at State Library, you may also be interested in an exciting panel event that we've got coming up called Legacy Reflections on Marbo. The panel will include co-curator and daughter of Cookie Marbo, Gail Marbo, as well as Queensland contributing artist Judy Watson, who's in the audience with us this evening. So Judy will be back, as well as Katina Davis, Davidson. And this free event will be on site and online on Wednesday, the 24th of August at 6 p.m. And you'll find all the details on our website. But for now, I do hope you enjoy the uh, conversation and please invite Janelle and Stephen to the stage. Thank you. Hello and welcome. Um, I'd like to welcome, to start with, the Auslan interpreters, Candace Wellington and Jamie Woodcock. Thank you. And, um, Farley Ward, who's uh, photographing this event, the photographer Farley, hi. Um, and a small housekeeping note, if anyone needs to leave for any reason, please use the door at the, I suppose it's my right, that right, um, of the top of the steps. And a reminder, as Vicky said, that we're using Slido tonight, so um, please log on to Slido and enter the code um, for any questions you might have for Stephen. And if you like anyone else's questions, you can um, vote for them as well. And I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we gather this evening, the Yagara and Turrbal people, who's, um, and pay respects to their elders, um, past, present, and future. Just a little bit more about Stephen. Oh. <clears throat> Stephen Page, AO, is a choreographer, a filmmaker, a director of theatre, festivals and ceremony, and a storyteller. He is an innovator and a trailblazer in the way he has transformed First Nations storytelling through performing arts. In addition to his Order of Australia, Stephen has received a NAIDOC Lifetime Achievement Award, a JC Williamson Award, an Australia Council Dance Award for significant contributions to the cultural and artistic fabric of the nation, and numerous other Helpman, Deadly and Film Awards, just numerous other Helpman and Deadly Awards. <laughs> film credits include the full-length film Spear, Brand New Day, The Sapphires and The Freeman Documentary. He's directed major festivals and events, the Adelaide Festival, the opening and closing ceremonies for the 2000 Olympic Games, and he created a new work for the Gold Coast 2018 Commonwealth Games opening ceremony. As mentioned, Stephen has been the artistic director of Bangara Dance Theatre since 1991 and choreographed over 27 signature works for the company. His most recent, recent work being Wajong, Not the Past, an epic scale contemporary corroboree, bringing together 17 dancers four musicians and five actors in the language of his father's Mananjali clan of Younger Bay country. Stephen, as mentioned, you're a Brisbane boy from Mount Gravatt, the 10th of 12 children, raised by your mother, Doreen, a saltwater Nunaka woman from Manjirba or Stradbroke Island, and your father, Roy, a freshwater Mananjali man from Younger Bay nation of southeast Queensland. How did your formative years prepare you for a career in the arts? Okay, I've got to try to summarise my memory. Um, <laughs> I'm sure all of you have seen too much of me over the last year, and you probably know this story more than I do. Well, not really, but um, look, I, I've just always said, uh, I don't know, something must have been happening when I was born. Um, Something must have lined up, or my father might have been singing a song and shaking his leg, I'm not sure. But um, I, you know, 16 years in Brisbane. Um, you know, I was born in 1965. By that stage, I think Francis is here tonight. Um, Francis, what number are you? You're one, two, three, five. And um, 
No, I know, because Franny and I are roughly, I think, Franny, are you, we're 10 years apart. 10 years apart, yeah. Because um, I got scared because Hunter said, oh, you're going to be 60 in 2025. And I said, thanks, Hunter. <laughs> and, um, and then I, well, my niece told me that Francis was 70 in 2025. I think that's right. Yeah. Uh, you're an October baby. I'm a December baby. Maybe we should do a party together. What do you think? Yeah. Um, but th the point I'm making is, um, you know, 65 into the early 70s, I'm in primary school. By the end of the 70s, I'm finishing up high school. By the beginning of the 80s, um, I'm a 17-year-old arriving in Sydney, you know. So, and then for the last 41, two years, I've, I've been in Sydney. So, when you say what, yes, your childhood does. You know, we, mum and dad, I mean, the generation that they came from, the unknown, the challenges, the, the trauma that they would have carried, and learning how to accept that, um, you know, the mental health challenges that they would have gone through, um, all of that, let alone trying to, the love of fresh water and salt water, have these clan of 12 kids, you know, and three girls, a boy, three girls, a, the deadliest boy, and then, f <laughs> the, and, and then the last four, which were quite close, so we're all, the siblings are all quite close. We, we, yeah, in, in terms of, you know, from 12 months to 18 months to two years to four years. So there's a variation between the gaps of the 12. You know, we probably would have had about 16. I think mum had a couple of miscarriages. David was a twin. Imagine having two of David. Um, <laughs> you know, so, yes, it shaped me, all those experience being in a city, you know, mum had to leave and the oldest girls, you know, most of the girls had it, had it tough, you know, like working at a young age and whether it's biscuit factories or shoe factories or the pineapple cannery at a quite a young age, especially the oldest two and three, you know. Um, you know, there's a great work ethic. My father had great principles. He was an amazing, had amazing work ethic. He did everything from, you know, electric linesman to rail, any, any job he could get, you know, and plus he was in a generation where his mother was challenged by our social environment, you know, um, politically, um, celebrating their culture, forbidden from language and displaced, all, all those common social shifts is from that generation, especially in a lot of southern urban environments, you know, displacement and all that shapes you. So was I aware then? You're not, you know, you, you can only be aware when you reflect back. So, but it's the clanship, the family, the love, the trauma, the ups, the downs, the crazy, dysfunctional energies, everything, it naturally does shape you. And, you know, we, we were exposed to quite a lot of personal challenges within the family. Um, so by the time I got to college, I think I was trying to get the first plane out because I thought, I'm going to go crazy. If I was, no, stay in this family. No, I wasn't going to say that. But, <laughs> but, 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 you know, like, I, I, I left school in year 11. Um, my sisters, uh, I think Donna and Gail, because they, they went to McGregor High, and they were sort of given the opportunities at that stage to, to further their education through to 11 and 12. I tried to, you know, mum was trying to push me through that. You know, I was rebellious at school in year 11, and mum said, go and get a job if you can't go back. You know take a week or two but go back because you know I was a bit corked up in high school but you know it was that and for some reason I got connected to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Legal Service and Barry Walsh um, was a partner of my auntie my first, um, uh, cousin I call her auntie Lorraine and he was working at the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Legal Service in, in, in Roma Street and you know Vivian Walker was working there I think Cheryl Brickenna I met a lot of cousins and families and I need to see you, Smith, I used to see her, and, you know, I need to new knuckle. Like, I just seen through this foundation of legal, social voice and opinion at a young age, that shaped me as well. Like, that was my first taste of resistance and, 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 and a political voice. Um, and then I saw a poster of, of, of the Aboriginal and uh, oh, Islander Dance Theatre, and now it's called NASTA, and it was a college set up by an African American in the early 70s and everybody else, and it was the only one of its kind, and they just had an, uh, uh, an advertisement for um, careers in dance. And then my other cousin, Marcia Bori, was working, uh, I'll probably get this all wrong, um, but through Aboriginal study and education and so forth, and she helped uh, put an application in for me, and pretty much in six months I was 
on TAA and I was in Sydney and got to live with uh, my my sister-in-law, Kerry Saylor, and um, crazy world of Sydney in the 82. Can you imagine what Sydney was like? All my father could think of was King's Cross. And I was like, Dad, I'm not going to be a stripper. I'm not going to be uh, a prostitute. I'm not going to... Um, you know, because you know, at that time, that's all he, he would imagine. And I think also, too, you know, the girls left, the two elders, you know, they all got married young and they all... You know, they travelled, Jerry travelled away and Janice travelled away and, and in a way I think there was not, there's just not enough room in that House Commission house, you know, like you, you'd get promoted in each, you know, when, as soon as I kept saying, hurry up a sibling, get out so I can get a room on my own, you know, and, um, but, but, but that's all informative, you know, my father wasn't allowed to laugh because he had the loudest laugh and he had a pillow, my mum would give him a pillow so he wouldn't make noise. Be- <laughs> Because if we were all laughing, watching the colour TV that Dad got from the dump and used pliers to fix it, and Dad was the best handyman. He, he would take us to... At, at, our exhibition was going to the dump on Sundays because we would collect all these things, and Dad would just... He was just amazing. His hands, his, his, his craftsmanship was amazing. And um, anyway, the point I'm making is I, I think all of that and watching... You know, they were into... Mum was into ballroom from Cloudland days and Dad loved country and western, Charlie Pride and Rawlin loved Elvis. She cried for four days when he died and, um, you know, the Beatles and, and we, we, we were popular culture. It was all in the house and I suppose that was my first taste of contemporary and what that was. But then, you know, every now and again we'd, we'd shift from that concrete environment and the girls were much more closer to being on country, uh, of dad's country and connection with mum's country. So there, were, there was always this thing of family and clan and our mum and father's so they were always there. And, and they knew that, this, that there was this hub in this house commission in America because that was the place to go if you wanted to have a good sing-along and you wanted to have a story. So, and all you wanted to see David do the best floor show, drag show in, in, in yeah. town. Um, So, when you say, what shaped you, (laughs) I suppose all of that and then having the opportunity, being there at the right time and then going to the school in the early 80s and then the next family was a mob from all over the country. I was going to be very short for you. No, no, no. It was very hard to butt into any of that because it was... um, it was so oh, very rich. Everything about that life that you would have had, um, and all of the sing-alongs and recitals. And when you say that your father, um, uh, your exhibition was his his stuff. I remember David saying that as part of the exhibition, because she couldn't afford it, he used to take his nephews up on the road to Margaret Lookout, and, and the car was one of those, you know, roller oh, coaster Oh, yeah, David. David was David was my first director. He would. Um Make us boys dress up and perform. Jackson Five, Supreme. I did my first drag show at three. Um, <laughs> you know, we had a we were on the hill in Marikabat, and then you know that was established. I could be wrong. I think we were one of the first in the early '60s because David was one, I believe, um, and because Mum had to come for because Philip um, needed medical attention. The third. Um, so uh, he, he needed uh, medical treatment, um, and she uprooted. And obviously, you know, Dad. It was tough for Dad, too, to uproot from his family to be in an urban environment. Mm. Like, I never thought about that till years later. And, you know, anyway, I won't, I won't go into the struggles they had. But, um, yeah, a lot of that. And, and David was totally... You know, Mum would... She was tough, Mum. She would rarely let us out of the house. And so, therefore, we had to let our crazy minds go crazy. And David would do everything and anything to entertain. And he'd stir us up and... You know, if one got in trouble, we'd all have to line up because we'd all get flogged. We used to get flogged in those days. Mum and Dad would be in jail today if they did that. <laughs> but, um, but, 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 you know, like um, all of that, all that sibling tension and, you know, and I, and I had a love of pop culture and music and, you know, new wave music and, you know, coming out of punk boom and I used to see Tracy Moffat walk up the street with green hair and I go, who is that? Um, <laughs> You know, David was a pop star young, and mm. so we, we, we sort of got introduced to a lot of this sort of, I don't know, this performance was always a Opp- performance within the... And opportunities opportunity were, were there. The page so yeah. tell us then, in 91, you mm. become artistic director of Bangarra Dance Theatre. How did that come about? 
because you go to ARDT, then... With hey, you jumped staff. a whole ten years of yeah, that. Yeah, I know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Got to get through a lot. <laughs> oh, I know. See, I can't talk short one. Oh, Lord. See, no, if no, I talk no. my language, it'd be shorter than the English language, and it wouldn't take that long for... No, um, look, from 82 to 85, I only did three years at the college, and that was a, a, a stomping ground for quite incredible when I think about it, quite profound, because you the coming together of mob from all over the country, and we come from all walks of life of upbringing. You know, like there was this vulnerability and a tension between the Aboriginal and the Torres Strait. You know, that's early 80s. You know, there was this sense of communication and acceptance of what that is. I mean, you gotta remember, I was born, you know, two years, a couple of years around the changing of the referendum, you know, and by the middle of the 70s, you know, we're in ten embassy moment, you know. So there was all these significant political mm. imprints that were around the trajectory of, of of my career, you know. And so by the eighties, well, you know, it was pretty prolific. You had the urban mob versus the traditional mob who had language, and were they deadlier than the ones that were displaced? And then you had the Torres Strait coming in, and then you had the fair skin and the ones, you know. We were all from a completely this outside view coming in and somehow we're all shaped to be one, you know? And what made us one was song and dance. Mm. And as soon as you sung and you danced, everyone felt good, you know? And then we were challenged when we'd leave that space. And then, you know, we were staying at bloody Enfield and dear old Annie Evelyn Scott was the first Hostel manager in them days in the 80s. Remember, hostels were big and hostel managers, and we were all young saying, Did we get a fortnightly check for, I don't know, $80? Like, you had to survive, and, and you know, we'd all look after each other, cook for each other, but the sharing of cultures and then, then having those, all those elders, whether it's Pitindara, Nora Ward, all them Yungu, my Mona Mama Amalas and Bandak Marika and through the Kimberleys and Ningley's family and Jensen and Pinau and Miriam Mob and Cyber, like all this this culture generosity that were coming through teachers, they were my first teachers and elders. And then at the same time, you know, I'd go in Aunty Mum Shirl and Uncle, you know, my brother Tiger Bales and they were running, like there was this whole social shift and I think of Bamali starting around the same time as Bengara in 91, 92, possibly a little bit in its, in its thought earlier, but these, these, these contemporary responses to traditional responses. So there was this amazing melting pot of, of birthings of, of these little satellites of cultural foundations that were still trying to work out who they were. And when I say who they were, you know, it was a big culture shock for me to go to mm. on country and hear language and to dance with mob that younger and you weren't sure if they were laughing at you or with you, you know, and then they saw this real fair fella and then all of a sudden they said, hey, he can do traditional, what's going on here? And it's interesting, like my brother Russell went through that, like this real sense of were we meant to be in the fate of reconnecting? And that's okay. And what we don't appreciate and we should be respecting a lot more is the sharing of cultures. And that's one thing I learned in that company. And I think it's, you know, we're all gonna be different individually. We're all gonna have diversity in our beliefs and our choices. But this love of, of, of culture and land and people and language and reviving that and caring for that was a was something that I took away from that 10 years and then I became director of 91. Yeah. Well, I just think it, you were also a game changer back then in those early days because oh, as you were alluding word. to, it, you were, it was inevitably running parallel and intersecting with those major political moments, significant moments in Australian history. Yeah. There's the protest march in 1988 and Paul Keating's Redfern speech in yeah. 92. So how much, and you've sort of covered that a bit, did this period help pave a path for Aboriginal contemporary art and culture to emerge and flourish? So mm. all of these different cultures are coming together and they're sharing mm. and it's an explosion of creativity and, and culture. Yeah, look, I... 
yes, you're right, and I think all that beginning in 89 was the year Bangara was birthed in October around a kitchen in Glebe with Cheryl Stone and Malcolm Cole and Sylvia Blanco and Monica Stevens and Jasmine Goulash and Richard Tolonga and bless his soul, Philip Langley, and I remember, I remember them. And I'd gone to Sydney Dance, you know, and did they choose me, Graham and Jenna from Sydney Dance? They came to the, the end of year show of the college, it was at Belvoir Street, and did they select me out of all those dancers performing in their third year because I was fair or was it because I had something? I couldn't tell. Well, Graham you know, and Murphy did say I that you were say. more than a dancer. He, he obviously spotted and identified your, your yeah. capacity and your talents very well, early I, on. I think at that age, though, you just, you know, all I saw was having the opportunity to dance in a commercial company, a mainstream company. It wasn't until I got there that I realised I was missing my mob. <laughs> and then I was like, how do I have both? And in a way, I think that foot in each world became that grounded knowledge that made me confident to become the director in 91. I had two beautiful brothers who pushed me up the front and then go on, Stephen, you're a big nerdy, you go up the front. <laughs> and, you know, I looked back and then I thought I had to act to be an artistic director so I had to talk real proper <laughs> way. And then um, I was like, what's a choreographer? And then. I was realising I was shaping movement and I was thinking, oh, that must come from those days of David dressing me in drag. <laughs> um, but whatever it was, we had all those graduates from the college that weren't getting work out in the mainstream because they had this distinctive style of contemporary traditional forms and it really was the first spine of Bangara's mm. physical form. Mm. And they all picked me, they were pushing me, but. Carol Johnson, who was the African-American director of the college, she was moving out of being the director of the college into wanting to be, I might, I might have took her job. Um, <laughs> she wanted to be the director of the professional arm and then she thought I was way too young, which she's probably right, but I was way, I was overly confident, that's for sure. Uh, and, but I don't know if that was just an insecurity of mechanism, you know, like, because people are pushing you there and then... Maybe it's just a huge energy that you have and you know that you've got s stuff to do. I know, and, and why am I always analysing it? Why don't I just yeah, accept it? exactly. Okay, I'll accept because, it, move on, I took over. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, when you're in this situation, you think you have to... That's my problem and I think I'm learning that now. You know he's teaching me that now? My three-year-old granddaughter, Mila. Uh, but but um, but you're right, you know. Like I, I think, but what I'm saying is, my family, you know, even my immediate family, my kids and Hunter and Sabine, you know, they let me have Bangara. You know, I left them when they were young, and from that point, I didn't realise the next 32 years for me was going to be this journey, because once it moved, it moved. Mm. You know, we hit 93, we're at Refn Park, his famous speech, Mr Keating, and we're support act for that. And we became this sort of guinea pig or this mascot for any shift culturally as this sort of little performing group. And then we were accepted in the Australian Council as a major performing arts company. We'd only been in it for six years. Um, you know, we had the great energy of, uh, you know, Robbie Bryan, uh, Gamilla Roy, uh, um, Bandilang, general manager, he was our first, he's been our only First Nations fellow who has been our executive director, you know. Um, you know, maybe that'll change in years to come. But, you know, we were, we were responding to the performing arts system. So, therefore, there's, there's a box like normal Western system and you've got to respond and then how to have a foot in each world. So, we were moving rapidly, you know, so fast, you know. By, by 97, we're doing collaborations with the Australian Ballet. Before that, the year before that, 96, we're doing the handover in, in, uh, in Georgia, Atlanta, because that was a representation going into the Olympics. And then, uh, you know, we became a fully-fledged performing arts company, and I remember sitting with Michael Lynch and Lydia Miller, her first term working at the Australian Council, and they were like, are you ready to be a, f do you know what a full-time company is? You know you're going to get support? And I said, yes, because we're going to have a resource where we have a foundation where when you get resource, you become a privileged black. You know, and so therefore we have a responsibility to make sure that we are productive about this, you know. And I was really clear from then, yes, I can play in your Western system mainstream world, but the thing that grounded us 
was us and the process of us as a clan, Jakapura, the sharing of tradition, was the stories grounded me. You know, there's over 27 works, there's over 40 works that I've done. If I worried about the black and white noise outside, there's no way I could have got any of that done. Well, I'm you know, going to get to a question from the audience. Hey, there's a the biggest audience, mob of questions. But Go before on. I do, just to, to refer back to what you're saying, because you were, Ochre's with Jakapura was a turning point for, for you and Bengara. You were one of the first Aboriginal choreographers to do contemporary works, and it was a turning point for transforming traditional art and culture into contemporary mainstream dance theatre language. Yeah. So there's a question here from Stacey that says, how, do you get pe how did you get people to believe in your vision? Well, the, the, the first instance was when the college was started. It's because they had already come from this, uh, this energy anyway from the college. So the graduates all had the same vision. I was just the one that was pushed up the front. And then I think it probably could have been any one of, of those graduates going to the front, you know. But you had then, to back it up, though. You had to back yeah, it up. Yeah, look, look, my brothers were keen. You know, I had brothers and sisters in Jenna Manyanyan and Jakapura Manyanyan. You know, I think for Percy, Percy Jacona to uh, Jimmy Gagai to, you know, all these great support, they all believed in that vision. And, you know, they, they, they could feel safe in my confidence. Yes, I was arrogant. Yes, I was cocky. But, but, that, but that's what, sort of the survival ingredients you've got to have, you know. And, but as I got along, and even more now, after 32 years, I'd love to reinvent myself because I think I'm so over myself <laughs> that um, I just hope the next journey... Anyway, we, we can talk about that later. But I didn't answer the question. <laughs> How did you... Oh, it's gone. No, it did. It's gone now. It's fine. <laughs> I, no, they were just saying, how do you get everyone to believe in the one yeah, vision? I just think we came vision? from that clanship energy and it, so it was just an organic flow that people... Everyone was striving for that. All I'm saying was that I put my hand up to culturally lead that in that mainstream space. And so you did have a lot of collaborators, really oh, I, amazing collaborators, mm, stellar mm. artists in their own right, um, and... One of those was Jakapura. You've mentioned yeah. Jakapura. Um, so um, you've described him he's, he, as the fourth brother in your story, yeah. as a cultural carrier, songman, dancer, Yurikala man. So how did these people, how did these artists, the collaborators and Jakapura, help shape... Well, what did they teach you about leadership, actually? It, it, it was all in the art. It was all in the stories, you know? Like, us three Page brothers, we just... Russi used to love it because we'd just bounce off ideas and then we were Pura's eyes, Jakapura's eyes in the city and he was our eyes when he took us on country and we were the same. Like we, we just loved telling stories and he brought all that traditional cultural knowledge and then David, oh, I used to love watching him and David in a studio and, you know, he'd get Pura with his language to create contemporary stories and I remember Pura would get on and be talking his lingo to his mother and getting permission and then she would love it because he was you know he, he's a song man a dancer and a yadaki player not all mob can do all three what do you call it in western culture triple threat oh, triple threat. Yeah. <laughs> so he was a triple threat and there's only one rare him so it's a bit like David when he was a twin that first twin passed away. Mum said, it's okay, I've got seven kids. And that doctor said, wait a minute, you've got another one there. And my Auntie Teresa fell to the floor and she said, bless, what'd she say? Bless the Lord. Because she said David was sent from God. So David and Jakapura together musically, oh, I could just watch forever. Mm. Like just this sharing of language and David, David could tell, a, he could really get inside the, the spirit of a story. He'd He'd talk about the internal spirit, and I learned I learned that from him. And I, you can feel that in his compositions. You can. Do yeah. you think that's why Bangara's works <sighs> resonate so yeah. universally? I mean, you can't watch Bangara. It's such a. An well, you can't watch Bangara as, without that score. Well, it's an unmistakable aesthetic on so many in so many yeah. ways. There's the there's the choreography, which is the grounded, earthy. Um, choreography, and then mm. you can't mistake that sound. Yeah. There's that vocaling, vocalising of language, yeah. and then there's that haunting, pulsating sound that carries you as well. Yeah. And 
Everyone gets a, the same sort of experience. It's, it's, it, it, even Bangara itself is a triple threat. You get the culture, yeah. you get the music, you get the, the, the visuals, the, the striking design and, and costumes. Well, I think it's all the elements come together in the, under the one creation spirit. You know, we start with a blank canvas. Uh, we said, OK, we'll, we'll, we'll tell stories, live theatre. So therefore, all, all, all the art forms from scenic to costume, and they all get to share. We have to have a story first. Like David used to, oh, he'd get flustered. If I come in and I didn't have a story, he'd be like, go back out, don't come so back So how do you in. source your stories? Well, that's what I'm saying. It's just different relationships of, of, of families. Like the Banyayan family, Yungo culture was strong from the time Alma Chris and her family and so, like we, the relationship that dancers would come in and some, you know, some of our dancers, you know, some come because their backyard is 5% full of culture. Some dancers come in and they know who they are. And that's what we don't discriminate in our backyard. You know, you, you want to come in, you want to go to cultural university and learn knowledge, then come in a foundation that's 34 years of 65,000. You know, this whole new generation, you know, this whole new generation, they're all distracted by that digital poison. You know, they don't want to go back and listen to knowledge. They think they know it because they can just Google. But, you know, you've got to find a balance to, to keep them grounded in that organic way and still find yourself in that space, the digital space. Anyway. I want my, to ask you about the, com I jumped the company all over the going place to then. country yeah. on a regular basis, but we okay. do need to... I so did want to finish that, but that's okay. I um, don't know what there's I said. A, <laughs> uh, there's a question about when you're talking about becoming a company and having to get the funding. Um, oh, I wanted to talk about David, because <laughs> he... No, no, because he, he'd be locked in that cave on his own. I was... I was lucky in a way because I could go out and have 16 dancers in front of me, like a footy team. And every time we do an opening night, that's like a grand final every time. You know, because the dancers, you know, they just don't pop up and you put an Aboriginal Ever Ready battery in. Like they, there's, there's, there's a big shift in maintaining the body and the understanding, understanding the cultural story, all those mechanisms. And David, he'd be locked in that room and... You know, some days I go in and he go, oh, I can't do it today, I'm bogged down. And I go, don't worry, it's all right. And then, you know what would get us through? He go, what about that time when Roy Lane? And we just go back and tell a story from home. And then he always, or I would say something, like remember a time, because I just didn't want him to feel pressured, you know. Mm. David struggled the most, I think, between him and I in terms of responding to that Western system. And, you know, you got Bangara, he was delivering a soundtrack for 25 years every year. Not even Prince or Michael Jackson could do that. You know, like, he was changing the, the, the soundtrack to this landscape. You know, he was working... The song men and women that were in that studio, from Uncle Archie to Chucka to Annie Ruby to all those different elders, I think I used to go in that room and think, wow, they'd all have their headphones on and some of them would have their headphones on for the first time and they'd love it and they'd look at him through the glass and he would tell them a little story and then they would just do the crossover and fusion of ideas. So maybe our energy people felt safe with that or people felt they could work with that you know and, and David had the biggest heart of all like he he used to get me sometime he'd go you're getting too white come here <laughs> and I go what do you mean he said you talk you talk like you're talking like the system like don't and he would shake that off and I'd come in and then I'd become the younger brother you know, because I was his boss, and but he'd make me the younger brother real quick, and he'd make sure that when we'd go home, we go to Bedez, and he goes, Stephen, do you know your cousin, that one there? And I go, Yeah, David, I know them. Like he'd go on, like you know, because so he. How did you direct him with Paige? Well, Paige, we struggled the first week. I almost walked out, <laughs> and then he just went, You know what you're doing, eh? And I said, Yeah, of course I do. And I said, You know what? And this is why I want to thank my family, because no one asked my brothers and sisters for us to be public, you know. And we became public because of working so quickly through the mainstream. And I apologise to my family, because we never asked them, you know, if they were okay with our stories and who we become. 
they can go mad at me later. But um, but the thing is also like David David really um, anyway. I lost my train of thought, but he um, he was very instrumental. Yeah. yeah. So you've lost both David and Russell. Did creative medicine? Did creativity help as a medicine? And and can other leaders? Use creativity as a medicine. Look, it's different for everybody. We all, you know what? You know, it's not. We're not alone. You know, suicide's a big problem in this country, and it becomes a mechanism because resources aren't there for us mob and communities in different different levels. You know, from rural to regional to metropolitan, it's different. Um, and I think. Um, Art is a healer, it's a medicine, you know, and, and it's a huge part of Aboriginal and Torres Strait people's lives, you know, it's part of their kinship system. It's not just something we support after sport. It, it, it's embedded. You know, you have ceremonies for birthing and marriage, you have, they're significant. So adopting those traditional kinship system and mapping it into this contemporary life is what I believe and I, I know people use, when that does happen, it, it was a healing for me. I think it's healing of David's music became, it's a bittersweet situation because you can heal within it and you can go forward. I, I am just fortunate. I, I know each of my siblings found to navigate their own way. They would all find their ways of dealing with it and that's their choice and personally to them. But I know, uh, I'm assuming and I, and I, I feel um, the medicine of, you know, me staying there and creating and Bangara shows. Yes, it was it was challenging, and and yes, I fell over, and I was wounded. I was wounded for a long time, and um, I feel like now I'm able to, as I shift out of Bangara and my contract finished at the end of the year. They announced late into last year. It takes took too long. I said, oh, they should have just announced at the end of the year so I could just <laughs> walk away. Um, but um, but I've been able to reflect a lot, you know, and I know the company's in great hands with Francis. I know the legacy's there, but I've been able to really just um, feel a bit clearer in the head about um, reflecting all, all those memories. And part of my life and my professionalism was us being so personal and public, but also because it's very rare to have your personal siblings mm. in your profession. Mm. You know, it is that, you know, for David to look at me and say, oh, he's my boss, but you know, he's my little younger brother. You know, like, I, we knew, we, we knew, and you know, we try to protect that, and I still try to, to protect the spirit of both him and Russie's legacy within what they've given to the company, because their spirit and their energy is, is a huge part of, um, yeah, it's a huge part of the heart of Bangara's legacy. And do you think that's part of what inspired you to remain as the company leader for so long, uh, and, and well, not for so long, but for the, for the, for the nearly 30 odd years that you were there, um, there was so much richness and so many stories to tell. Yeah. And, and so is that, Oh, I'm an obsessive black. I'm an obsessive artist. I'm addictive to it. Um, that's all I know, you know? 32 years, payroll, that's all I know. You know, like, so one I don't even know if I'm going to have a job achieved, after this. One question from the audience. You've achieved so much creatively. What do you still really want to do or try? And this is, oh. links up with another question. What are you going to do after Bengara? Uh, as AD. Yeah, look, I, um, you know, my son was quick. He wanted me to get out of Bangara so we can start a production company. He, he already named it, took money and started an ABN. And I said, I said, you don't even know how to run a business. You can't just do that. Um, so he had the Hollywood version that we would um, mo move into film and do all of this. But you know what? He, that's fine. It's just lovely to watch his enthusiasm. You know, he was dancing. Him and Remy, they were, our kids were around the growth of Bangara mm, and they, they got in, they, they you know, they grew up around it, you know. So um, even even my nieces and nephews, I remember when I did Kin with Hunter yes, and Sanson and that. Sean and just, like, even I get really sad from it because... <laughs> <laughs> Have a glass of water. Give you some water. It's such a no, because time. I, you know, we we have such a big family, and I feel I gave a lot of energy to Bangara, and I feel like I left my family behind sometimes. And um, and you've lost 
Oh, no, no. Serious family. Yeah, yeah, but well. I know. But I think as brothers and uncles and, and um, you know, have we done enough? Because, we, you know, big families, they're challenging. They're dysfunctional and they're wonderfully dysfunctional. But, you know, I just, I just want to be able to move on. I just want to be able to be with my son and my grandchildren. And I, I want to just you be... You have two grandchildren, yeah, granddaughters Mila's and Mila's three. Three. Well, she's three going on 30. And... Um, <laughs> You know, and Ivara's the opposite. Ivara is as fair as her pop, and she's got the darkest feature. And she's and, only a few months old. Oh, they both got the page nose. Real. <laughs> and, um, and Mila's the opposite. So Hunter said, Dad, I've got one Stephen and one David. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, they're, they're good. And, and Laura, my daughter-in-law, and Hunter. And yeah, he's good, Hunter. He, he, and, you know, he had to put up with me, and he had to... You know, I always kept thinking, oh... I'm going through it, but are they safe? You know, because he's going through it with me as well. I think he's exhausted by my career, to tell the truth, and I think that's why he was so well, quick. He's, he's, he's so quick prolific. to go, come on, Dad, let's go. He's you know? pretty prolific himself. I think you've produced a really fine, incredibly young man because you can't turn television on today without seeing his face. <laughs> he's, he's, he's on fire. Yeah. On fire. Um, he literally is on fire. But, um, <laughs> and... and um, yeah. Some of those other medic, uh, forensic shows. And, uh, <laughs> so Harrow's and yeah, Barron's yeah. and Fires yeah. and Play School. He's everywhere. Yeah, he's everywhere. So, you know, he's a pretty talented young man. Yeah, and no, I he, saw he's, him he's a good young age. man. And, and he, um, you know, I just try to be really honest with him. And he, he's lucky because he's had resources. He's had a great mother and myself. And, you know, we, 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 we're pretty pretty transparent, like we're pretty, we, we, we talk constantly, you know, and, you know, it's a big issue in all of us, you know, we're, we're mental health and surviving, you know, we have resources now, you know, I think of my mum and dad and my mum, you know, like they didn't, the mob just didn't have that resource, you just had to build Get that resilience, mm. you know, and that's what we carry from our mum and dad, that's what we carry from our ancestors, you know, and... I know with my nieces and nephews and my great nieces and my nephews and my great great nieces and nephews that they can feel like they do have an internal resource and that is the resilience of all of us, you know, and we're all going to find in our own way and our own choices, but at the end of the day, you know, that spirit from the clan that come from my mum and dad will always be there if you want to swallow that and reflect that, you know, and it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a moral and a value that sits in a lot of mob all around the country, and it doesn't matter in your profession or in your immediate backyard. You know, cultural values and principles are a huge part Tell of our me, life. as an urban Aboriginal, you would take the, com the company to country a lot. Yeah. And annually. What, what... Oh, we're so bad, we're not even answering these 20 <laughs> questions. <laughs> No, no, no I, you, I think you're right. I think all mob that, you know, like, I hate the word mob. Um, clan, families around the country come to me and they come to Fran, different, different song lines, Torres Strait Aboriginal, urban, rural, mob that are just reconnecting. You know, there's challenges, there's a fragility. And they say, hey, Paige, you got a platform there, you perform at the Opera House, hey, here's a story. And so... We're entrusted with this story, but the one thing I always want to maintain that we take it back on country. Like Sansong was a, a, a gift back to Niggly Lawford's family, and at the end of the year, the company will return to Fitzroy, go to the old high school, lay down the tar kit, put the costumes and paint on like we at the opera house, and we do it for the mob, you know? And we've been doing that for the last 20 years. And we do it just as good as we do at the Opera House too. And what we're seeing now through Sydney and Sunny, who are retired dancers at Bangara who run our education program, we're seeing the next generation come through. And so there's this beautiful cycle of inspiration so and that stories goes to being that passed question. through the um, families. Sorry, um, sorry um, Janelle. How oh, do you geez, encourage performers talk. to keep growing, influence and adding to the art landscape? What do you think is needed to continue the story? Jeez. <laughs> oh, look, I just think we have to accept there's no resolution in time. Life is process. And, you know, you look at it now, we have... Look at all those women in Parliament now, like, change of government. The blackfellas are receiving because we put up with the Western tide. It comes in and it goes away. 
our same issues get played out constantly. They just retitle it a different English word. If I hear never recognise or reconciliation or restoration, like you got to, it, it's always it, it, that's the way it goes. It goes with the tide, you know. But you got all exhaustion of mob from the past that are carried into the future of leaders. Like there is change, but all I'm saying is is the arts and storytelling is it's a huge part of Blackfellow culture. And you know, it, it, for me, that that's where I become the political person because it's through your art and it doesn't have to be literal social activism. It can be, you know, people hate words symbolism, but there's symbolism with impact. It's you so know? impactful. What you do is so Sound, impactful. And it's not a sledgehammer approach, even no. though you do, you don't shy away in a lot of your work. Oh, that's just from, 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 from death and custody off, and, 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 and yeah. alcoholism. You, you often hmm. sprinkle your sublimely beautiful works, you sort of, as an audience member, you then get a little slap on the face to go, hey, mm. it's not just about the beauty of culture, it's also yeah, about... Yeah, but also, too, I think we have to we have to accept the diversity of our leaders and whether you're from resistance or you're a legislation person or you're an academic or you're a lawyer or you're a concreter or you're a storyteller, you know, and you know where you come from and you belong and, you know, w w we're all, I think, now in this new decade is, you know, this this decade now in the 21st century, I think, you know, we've been talking about truth from the heart. We've been doing that as a practice right from, you know, 65,000 years ago, mm -hmm. you know? So it's only because we're distracted by the Western system and the Western poisons. That breaks down and dilutes down and that's a contemporary part of assimilation. But anyway, the point I'm making... There's an interesting question about how would you explain... Cult oh. It's sorry. It's I, gone. I, I started oh, look at this one. You two talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> How dare they, Janelle? <laughs> no, I, I was um, reading from Lynn. That's as terrible. A, <laughs> from a, as a choreographer, how do you avoid repeating? In, how do you avoid repeating in your dances? Because that's an interesting question. And as far as I go to your works to see unique works, mm. the, your groundedness in, in, mm. in that aesthetic. There's an aesthetic that is, we said before, it's unmistakably Bangara. So how But why you... would you avoid repeating? Because no one says to the ballet why they keep doing Swan Lake. <laughs> and they have to keep doing that because that's the only thing that sells. <laughs> so... A we're, we're, we're 34 years of 65,000 years. We've only just scratching the surface. Mm. You know, we've only got 27 works in our creative cultural pantry that we started with nothing. Um, those works are our knowledge. When a generation of dancers come on, you've seen, you've got this generation of dancers that do terrain. That was only 10 years ago. It's timeless, you know. And each audience leaves with the same... Exhilaration well, and the same Well, only you can view how you view it. I'm not going to play with your ears, your binang and your senses and how you watch something, but movement and music and contemporary ceremony, all of that is just a medicine to challenge the perception of your, your spirit. Mm. And if you, there's a thread of that that can connect. The problem with Western system, it always wants to understand rather than accept. And we're just accepting a long, big serpent process. So that's a Western system approach of repetition. Our repetition is, is ritual. Repetitions in the way we meditate, the way we care for country. I remember going up when I was 17 and we went on just before wet season out to Dalamboy, Yungu. And before wet season and dry, I always become a three-year-old because I, I like to talk, but to be quiet, what I noticed was that they were respecting the change of season, so no one was allowed to talk. So there was a practice in the way you quiet on country. And it's for, 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 oh, I never stopped talking for so long. But then I realized, the earth I thought my father was quiet, he would hunt quietly and but just all, just all the humane practicalities, like what we've had to shred off as black mob, because that's the true stuff that I want to be fed into our contemporary society for the future. You know, is 
breaking down the system, Western system, supremacist system. And the world in this 21st century, look at that orange fella last year, America. They're, they're, they're all, look at that orange Ipswich woman. They're, they're all eating the... No, they're, they're, they're like, they're, they're, they're children of people that have eaten their own head of system and power. You know, because we're, my, it's funny, eh, because my dad used to say, don't worry, don't travel the same road, travel, travel the one that you come from, and that's, I always think of that, I think that's, that's it, you've got to, and I think that's, that's been a huge part of my drive at Bangara, is to really just fight for that perspective and that resilient perspective, and we all do that as storyteller. Not everyone's a storyteller, not everybody's a triple threat like Jakapura. <laughs> But we all have a story, and I'm just fortunate that I got chosen in my fate in life, this existence, to, to, to work. But you know how to distill stories as well, and I think that's what Oh, not always. You want to see me at home when I go home, oh, Lord. <laughs> um, now, we've got five minutes, um, going on four minutes. But look what they said again, Janelle. <laughs> no, Gavin. Um, the Lakes College says, thank you for filling the future children with our stories. With uh, Sorry. Thank you for filling the future children with our stories, with movement, music and stories. We hope the children's children will be viewing your pieces. Wow. Well, that's a good way to wrap it up. Oh, we've got a few minutes. Um, just a few more minutes. Um, with all of your works, what is your most favourite piece? Your absolute most favourite piece? Oh. Um, see, I always can't answer this. Because <laughs> they, they, they're all a part of one big serpent of stories, you know, like there are special ex moments through stories, like they've all got a little special, they've all got a little shining special moment through it's each like one. A, a previous question before which I didn't ask, do you have a favourite si sibling? And I, I don't know if it was one of the siblings who asked that question. <laughs> but, so this is an interesting question. Who have been or still are your most important influences or mentors? I mean, I know we've talked but, uh, about everybody. David, Jack Port, yeah, like but all those Francis you know, Wings. I've all 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 those teachers and elders and um, from urban to mm. like all, and not just I don't know, just all I've ever been really fortunate. I've just had being in the same conversation as Uncle Archie and creating a work with him. I remember we did Spear. Uncle Archie was performing around. It was coming to the end of the 90s and he was like, boy, what do you, what do you want me to do? And I said, oh, can you come and do like, like a theatre piece but you get to tell your songs through that theatre piece. And I remember the first day, we were, I didn't know what we were doing. Wayne, Wayne Blair just came from QUT. His first acting job was with Bangara. Jakapura, Rassi, Rimi and Hunter were there. They're only six and nine. And Victor and Lewis and Sydney and this, this amalgamation of black fellas. And we all got to share a traditional Archie story and just sitting around in a circle for hours and hours. And then out of that, we just shaped this dance song story work and it was like the spirit was stronger than us and we just had to make sure we had a responsibility to care for it and you know there it i always say it's in the process mm. if you're you're honest to that process and you build it from there it don't matter what the product is which work was that every work <laughs> No, because people used to tell me, oh, do you, people say, oh, do you worry about the audience? Oh, what's the reviewer going to say? And I thought, that reviewer, they're not even black, I don't care. <laughs> like, who can tell me what I do best at what we do? You know what I mean? Like, it's like, well, I remember Spike Lee did do the right thing, and he said, how can a non-African-American version try to review what I'm doing? Sure, they can talk about the techniques, but we come from heart and story, so anyway. Last question I'm going to ask is... Who's my advice, mother and who's my father? Advice, no. <laughs> advice for young people. How do you find resilience and persistence over the years in the inspirational way you have? Oh, all, all of the above, you know. Like, I'd like to still think, you know, it's just all those experiences. It's just all connecting with all those energies. Um, I get really frustrated if I'm... Like David used to say, you're too white, come back. Um... And I don't mean to be that in a cynical way, a little bit of me does, but just trying to be as, as grounded and as true 
to yourself, you know, and... Maybe you had to... And, and take... then when you connect with people like that, they build that sense of, you know, persistence and they, they help you, they, they push you along, they work together and you create a shield of resistance. Like, the resilience in my immediate family and they're here tonight, like, pretty extraordinary, mm. you know, and that, that's just come on from the, the clanship of my mum and dad and old Granny Polo, you know, like, generations before that generation, you know, like, it's just embedded in us well, as, as, as human I, beings. I envy you, I, I think you're... It's the way we trigger it, I always say that. Like, it's there, it's the way you choose how you want to trigger it, you choose how you want to shape it, you know? If you want to disrespect it and let it all go, well, good luck. You know, but if you, if you, if you want to... If you want to acknowledge it and, and respect it in yourself, it gives you fuel to keep pushing. You know? I think it's, it's time to wind up, but I think it says a lot about your wonderful family and how they raised you. Yeah, oh, look, totally. Like I could, as I said, like now it's going to be a beautiful time to, I don't know, I've got to come back and then I've got to get a ticket and wait in line because I've been a city boy for too long. <laughs> uh, uh, and that's what I love, you know, coming, oh, I want to come back home, you know, and Hunter's going to the UK for seven months. I said, oh, no, don't get too white, no. Um, <laughs> I said, where are you going to the best place, eh, to see the royal family, Lord? Um, but, um, you know, he said, oh, Dad, he have not even brought them girls up because of that pandemic. But, you know, what I loved about the pandemic, it made us all reset. It shut us all down and we all had to look in. And it reminds me of that meditative time when I was sitting in Darling Boy. I said, oh, look at that thing come now, my father would say. And he said, look, it's shutting everybody up. And everyone's got to reset and we've got to look what's around us, you know, distilling that. You know, my father used to always talk about that. Anyway, that's another I'm gonna story. I'm going to have to shut You're going to shut it down. Sadly, <laughs> I could sit here for hours. Um, the one thing that... an honour and a privilege, Stephen. Oh. Sorry, sit back down. Oh. Good evening, everyone. I'm Associate Professor Paige McGuire, Director of Alumni and Corporate I'm Events. I'm a Paige. <laughs> <laughs> I would be honoured to be a Paige. So I'm from QUT. Um, along with State Library of Queensland and Queensland Library Foundation, QUT is a proud founding partner of the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame. And it's a pleasure to have you all here tonight. Stephen, what can I say? I've just been blown away and I could listen to you for hours. Some of the things, I've got red pen all over my, my notes because I've taken down your wisdom. And I'm so, so happy to be here for you to have shared your wisdom with, with the community here tonight. Not only are you a, a creative, you're an influ influential leader, but more than that, you are so generous in your time and in your words ar around sharing your, your family with us tonight and, and how instrumental they were in your creative process and your continuing practice, both as a leader and as an artist. And all I can say is thank you so much. It has been wonderful to hear you. So thank you, Stephen. So some of the things I wrote down that you said um, are really great, and some of them may be from your dad, and some of them I think are from you. Um, travel the road you come from. I love that. I really love that. Um, and there's no resolution in time. Life is a process. I'm going to have to unpack that a bit. And for those of you who really need to unpack that more, um, you're in luck because we can revisit the conversation. Um, the transcript will be shared on the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame um, website later in the week. So if you're going to be like me, I'm going to go back and, and reread this and really think about what you've said tonight. Um, also, a big thanks to Janelle, Janelle Christophus, for um, sharing and supporting with us. Um, 
it was very clear that you two have an enduring friendship <laughs> and, um, and really are, um, have a mutual respect around the art and, and the creative um, side of life. So thank you so much. Okay. I've just got a bit more, but you can, you can sit down if you're... <laughs> it's all right. Um, on behalf of the founding partners, I'd also like to thank our sponsors who make this work, the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame, possible. Uh, thank you to our principal partners, our principal sponsor, Picture Partners, our media partner, Channel 7, our major sponsors, Morgans and Ray White, and our event supporters, uh, Brisbane Convention and Exhibition Centre, Cloverly Estate, New Street Brewing Co, and the Courier Mail. We are really grateful to have this ongoing support for our program. As you can see, it's a wonderful program, so we want to continue this. Also, thank you to the State Library of Queensland team who've put this together tonight. You've done a wonderful job. Um, it's been one of the best ones I've been to. Um, don't say that to no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and we know it's going to be one of the best because we have a survey. So if you, if you wanted to do the survey tonight... Um, and these actually tell us what we're doing right and what, and what we can improve on. And so we know that this will be something that um, it's going to be a hard one to improve on. So you can either scan the QR code behind me if you want to do it now, or for those of you who have registered by email, um, you can, you'll get an email uh, in your inbox tonight. So you can tell us then. I think most of the people at the back have already gone out the back door, but if those up the top want to leave at the top there, you can through the back door. Um, but other than that, Thank you, everybody, and thank you, Stephen Page, AO, and Janelle Kassoff. <laughs>